Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the Northumberland series. Northumberland is the northeastern tip of all of England. It's a unitary county containing 166 civil parishes. Let's see which one we're in today. Welcome back to Northumberland, everybody. Now, today you find us in the first of four parts to this episode because this one's so big we've decided to do this one yeah split it up like we did with felix stowe um last year in suffolk so you'll see it's looking different period. we will look different so uh, our um <laughs> our start point though is the same for three of the sections three of the four sections it's a street called woodley just there and you'll find woodley in new begin by the sea Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. New Biggin by the Sea is a quaint Northumbrian seaside town located on the North Sea coast. It's not a large town in comparison to others, but we decided to split this one up into four sections. Newbiggin is one of the main population centres in the former district of Wandsbeck, which was abolished in 2009 when the county of Northumberland became a unitary authority. In the 14th century, Newbiggin was a very important maritime centre, called upon to support Edward III in his campaigns against the Scots. In the Middle Ages, Newbiggin was a major port for the shipping of grain, third in importance after London and Hull. In later times, it shipped coal, produced from its very own mine. Fishing has always been associated with Newbiggin, although coal mining would eventually take over as the town's major employer. Tourism was a thing too. In the Victorian era, Newbiggin was Northumberland's favourite seaside town, attracting hundreds of visitors every day in the summer months. And here's a fun fact for you. The town was at the end of the first telegraph cable from Scandinavia in 1868, which ran between Newbiggin and Jutland in Denmark. Let's see what else we found over the four days we spent in the place. For the first three of the four sections here in Newbiggin, we parked in the same place, Woodley, which is a residential street just off the A197 or Woodhorn Road. It's a five minute walk away from the main shopping street. That would be Front Street, and for section one, we're heading north, where most of Newbiggin's shops and amenities are located. Until 2004, Front Street was part of a street fair that attracted thousands of people every year. The fair started at the beginning of the shopping area before heading up to the Cresswell Arms, which we'll see later, and then flowing into Church Point Car Park and continuing along the seafront promenade. It was quite the attraction. These days, the fair is no more. Front Street is lined with small independent businesses and the occasional pub, and its main shop is a co-op. New Begin by the Sea also has a town council, and its offices can be seen here at the end of this row of shops. So part one of the trip around New Biggin will focus mainly on the seafront and the town centre and it will flit in this first section of this first part, if that makes sense, between the two because there are plenty of these little ginnels between 
the beach, mm -hmm. the promenade, whatever you want to call it, and the, and the town centre, the main street which we've just come from. <laughs> um, this is the old ship, apparently, according to the uh, signs on its wall. A, it's an old pub. Or something now because it says for about entry to call this number. Yeah, it probably is some kind of hotel, yeah. Anyway, let's go and see the sea, Nikki. Yep. And with that, we're on the seafront. Look out over New Begin Bay and you cannot miss one landmark in particular. That would be Sean Henry's infamous couple statue, which depicts a man and a woman standing on a steel structure. The couple are seen gazing out to sea, something we all often do. The statue has received mixed reviews. Some hate it, some love it. Either way, it was completed in August 2007 and erected as part of a £10 million refurbishment project. The project also included half a million tonnes of new sand for the beach, which was transported from Skegness. A new breakwater was also laid in the bay, improvements were made to the promenade and a new playground was added too. And New Begin Promenade is famed for another reason. This is the longest promenade in Northumberland. Each spring and autumn, the promenade becomes a prime location for naturalists watching the North Sea seabird migratory passage. You know, I don't care who you are, how much money you've got, how old you are, or what your circumstances are, there's nothing quite like the sound of waves crashing against the shore. And that's one reason why Nikki is down there on her own surrounded by peacefulness, serenity, just taking in that fantastic sound of waves as they crash against the coast here in Newbiggin by the sea. It's so peaceful, so calm, so relaxing. As we head back to Front Street, we pass a pub called The Coble, and outside that is a traditional steel bandstand. This has been a feature of Newbiggin since the 1930s. It was refurbished in 2011 as part of the town centre refurbishment scheme. The Coble is just one of at least five pubs in Newbiggin. It's arguably the most popular. It's named after a type of fishing boat, and Newbiggin had 142 Cobles in 1869. It's such a popular pub that a local shop even recognises it as such. This is the window of So Quilted, a local haberdashery and clothing alteration business. The Coble is one of many New Begin landmarks which have been handcrafted by its owners using a three-dimensional quilting technique. Next we have the Salvation Army building. They've had a presence in New Begin since 1902. This, their current premises, opened in 1939 and it's right next to the Queen Victoria, a now closed pub at number one High Street. So this of course is New Begin's main shopping street as it were. There are other uh, shopping areas in the town which we will see uh, as we walk around both this part and the subsequent parts of this video. But uh, that's the main one anyway. Got a fair bit really hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, some interesting uh, place names and uh, uh, some nice little sort of, you know, bits to see and bits of art and and yeah. so on, it's, it's, it's quite nice. Yeah, it's been a good start. Mm. Okay, so now we're heading back down towards the seafront again, uh, down here, down this road called Sandridge. Here's the lifeboat station and rocket house. This was opened in 1851 following a fishing disaster in which 10 new begin fishermen lost their lives in stormy seas. This is the oldest operational boathouse in the British Isles. Rocket houses were vital and were found all along the coastline. There was one at Cresswell, for example. They worked by firing a rocket from the shore with a line attached to it to stranded ships that had run aground. It's a part of New Begin's history that's told in one of the three galleries within this building, the New Begin Maritime Center. Located at the end of the promenade, this replaced a former heritage center at a cost of three million pounds. It has a gift shop and a cafe and plenty of paintings on its walls. You see, New Biggin has an association with L.S. Lowry, who in 1966 painted this iconic landscape. The original painting is now on display in the Maritime Centre. So we've pulled in um, to stop for a uh, cuppa and that while we're walking around. There's some nice paintings on the wall here. All for sale. All for sale, yeah. Not exactly cheap. I mean, that one of Cresswell Beach is £89. 
and it's not the biggest painting in the world. I won't criticise though because it is it is lovely. Beautiful painting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, yeah, we're going to uh, sit here for a while and uh, rest and enjoy this wonderful sea view because look at this. How about that for a view from a cafe window? We are now on Church Point, which is sometimes known as New Begin Point. On here, there's a brick structure topped with a stone. That, my friends, is a time capsule. Now we come to the 13th century parish church of St Bartholomew, bleakly situated against the North Sea backdrop here at Church Point. The churchyard here contains a notable collection of medieval gravestones. Some of them are interestingly shaped. We'd never seen a cubicle gravestone before, that's for sure. Eight complete cross slab grave covers have been reset in the walls of the church's north aisle, which was rebuilt in 1912. The chancel, the east and western bays of arcades and the west tower are all 13th century and the spire dates to the 14th century. For centuries, this was a chapel only with a tower surmounted by the spire, which was originally used as a beacon. So the church is locked, but we can actually see in it quite clearly because these windows are not stained in any way, shape or form. So if I put the camera right up close to the glass, you'll be able to see inside. Around the back of the churchyard, you can see a row of caravans. They belong to the Church Point Holiday Park, operated by Park Dean Resorts. Church Point has no facilities or entertainment of its own, which is part of its unique appeal. Mind you, there is a golf club next door. This is New Biggin Golf Club, which occupies a tract of land along the cliffs north of Church Point. Established in 1884, it's an extremely challenging Lynx and Moorland course. And day one now ends with two pubs. First of all, the Cresswell Arms, which overlooks the Maritime Centre's car park. This has an interesting slogan on its side the last pub before Norway. You forget how far north this is sometimes. After a walk back along the High Street and Front Street, our route leaves New Biggins Main Streets behind at the Queen's Head. With a huge stone on its wall stating it was rebuilt in 1909, this features a restaurant, bar, terrace and free Wi-Fi throughout. Okay, now it's just a nice amble back through some of the more residential areas in this first part of New Biggin and back to Woodley. If there's anything else to catch, I will of course catch it, but otherwise I'll see you tomorrow for part two. Day two was to be a little wet. Heading along Front Street the other way, the first thing we come to is this building, St Andrew's Methodist Chapel, built in 1876. Before this existed, Methodists used a smaller building on Robinson Square. A footpath alongside that takes us back to the promenade once again, and here you can clearly see how the beach has been improved. The sand, which came from Skegness, was delivered by a trailing suction hopper dredger. As a beach resort, New Biggin was popular in the 1800s. As early as 1828, it had many facilities to cater for visitors, including at one of its public houses, an array of spa-like bathing facilities. By 1848, several guest houses took hold here. The smooth beach was about a mile in length and was well suited for bathing. The bay also gave good anchorage for small vessels, including numerous boats belonging to the local fishery where many inhabitants were employed. Lots more examples of local artwork along this wall. There's a couple there and a few further down. Yeah, dotted up the promenade. Yeah. Certainly an arty type place, isn't it? I think you find that a lot of seaside towns do have them now. They have like a lot of, you know, coastal heritage or, you know, local heritage artwork that's done by local students or children or something. And it's nice to see. Now we've climbed up to Beach Terrace, one of a row of terrace streets which overlook New Biggin Bay at its southern end. Despite the rain, this gave us probably the best view yet of the bay and all that's in it. Up here, we find New Biggin Bowls Club, located within the Milburn Park Pavilion. According to one online review, this is a warm and friendly place to play. It's open to the general public on a pay-as-you-play basis. 
A board here tells us of the Anglia tragedy of 1904, when the SS Anglia, on a voyage from Norway to Sunderland, ran aground on Spittle Cars, the rocks below, men from its rescue vessel were lost when a wave capsized their ship. We were just about to move on, but then we noticed a man looking out to sea with some binoculars. On the side of his vehicle were the words, New Begin by the Sea, Dolphin Watch. That was interesting enough to chat to him for a while. Yeah, we've had these, these dolphins the best part of 10 years at least. Uh, and we get them, they stay all year round now, they've been breeding. We've got lots of carp dolphins, there's a couple of carp dolphins out there as well. So, um... The man's name was Ivor, and after a brief conversation about the dolphins, we learned New Biggin is actually famed for them. We had no idea. He supplied us with this short video of them earlier that day at Cresswell. You can clearly see them jumping around playfully in the water, and what's more, there's even a Facebook group dedicated to them. I've linked the group below, it's well worth a look. As well as the dolphins, Ivor also catches the Aurora Borealis, which can be seen quite clearly from New Biggin too, if the weather is right. Day two continued by walking on past these aged miners' houses, which are off Melrose Terrace. Across the road, the allotment fans will love this today. There's a huge area dedicated to them, which stretches a long way south. Now for Gibson Street, which is what Front Street eventually becomes as you head south out of town. There are more shops down here, but they're a little more sparse. We've seen the old ship already, and here we have the new ship. According to reviews on TripAdvisor, this seems to be New Begin's best pub for food. You can eat here seven days a week, and the food is excellent, people say. Next is St Mark's Church. This was built in 1868 by stonemason William Gibson. Presumably, that's why Gibson Street is so named. St Mark's is now closed to worship, and in 2009 its congregation merged with St Andrews. Passing a boxing club here, New Begin Community Boxing Club. Don't see many of those. Next, we have this car park. It may not look like much, but a library used to stand here until very recently, located within an old school building. The library has now moved and the building has been demolished. Next, there's a McColls, which doubles as a post office. This used to be a co op. The Apostolic Church, founded in Wales, used to hire a room above this before relocating to the building which is now used by New Biggin Boxing Club. Trust me, those two things required a lot of digging to unearth. Not the case for these next two landmarks right next to each other. We've got a health centre and a dentist, both standing opposite an important park. This is a memorial park which originally opened in 1924 and was reopened after restoration in 2005. It has a stone memorial archway which is grade 2 listed with bronze gates, upon which memorial wreaths are hung on Remembrance Day. So this is interesting, the memorial park was opened by His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent on the 15th of June 2005 according to this stone right here. So I imagine we've got World War II on one side and World War I, yes, on the other side. Okay, and these are overlooked by three flagpoles, one of them flying a flag at the moment, the other two are not. Okay, oh, and there's a, another memorial here for other conflicts. So we've got Palestine, Malaya, Korea, Suez, Aden, Borneo, Omar, Northern Ireland, Falklands, Gulf, Balkans, Sierra Leone, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kenya. Nice. Now we go up into Central Park towards a school. Believe it or not, this used to be a railway line. We're standing pretty much on the site of New Biggin by the Sea Station, which was on the Blythe and Tyne Railway from 1872 to 1964. The former line has been lifted now and turned into the massive Central Park, and at the end of Central Parkway, there's a primary school. 
This is the NCEA Grace Darling campus. Grace Darling was a lighthouse keeper's daughter whose participation in the rescue of nine men from the shipwrecked paddle steamer Forfarshir brought her national fame. The ship ran aground on the Farne Islands off the Northumberland coast in 1838. Central Park also has a number of football pitches and a neat little playground. It certainly changed a lot since the days of the railway line, which once brought thousands of tourists to New Biggin to enjoy the seaside. It's turned into a bit of a damp squib today. It's it really has bucketed it down and we are wet. Um, it's not very pleasant at the moment. Um, and the other worst thing about it is we haven't found anywhere to sit and have a drink or something, you know, just to warm ourselves up. Um, it's been kind of bereft of cafes and things, hasn't it? This part of town. So, uh, yeah, a little bit disappointing. Anyway, we're almost finished with part two. The last stop uh, in this section is the leisure centre, which is that building you can see in front of me right now. All of this area was railway related as well, as we will learn on day three. For now, this is the New Biggin Sports and Community Centre, which only last year received a one and a half million pound refurbishment, thanks to the County Council. The centre has two full-sized football pitches that are used by a number of local teams, one of which is New Biggin AFC. It has a community cafe too, and this is also where the now demolished library was relocated to. Almost back at Woodley again, for the second time, we pass New Biggin Carpet Centre, and beyond that you can see Dee Belisle Court, a 59 room care home catering for a wide range of specialist nursing needs. Little Acorns Nursery rounds off day two as we reach Woodley once again. A very interesting day which was more about the generally unseen areas of the town, and it included dolphins. You don't say that very often, now do you? Well, it's a bit drier in here, thankfully. Yeah, it's got all wet again all of a sudden. Yeah, anyway, that's uh, two sections down in New Biggin. We'll see you tomorrow for section three. At the end of day two, we opted to go out for food. It had fallen dark and I'd noticed the church was lit up. I still had the GoPro with me, so after we'd eaten, we went to see it, even if it was in the dark. I also tried to get a shot of the time capsule, which didn't go very well. I guess daylight will always be the preferred option when I have the camera in my hand. Mind you, this was worth the effort for another reason. You see, Church Point is different to New Biggin Bay. The breakwaters in the bay dampen the waves somewhat, and so here you can really hear the roar of the mighty North Sea. Have a listen to these waves as they crash against the shore. Okay, so for part three, I'm on my own. Nikki decided to uh, take refuge in the hotel room for this part. The reason being mainly because it's residential. There, there isn't really much to talk about of any interest in this part. However, I do know that there are some things to talk about. One of those is behind these railings. Behind there, there used to be a school. If you're quick, you can still see this school on Google Street View. It still shows the former Moorside School buildings before they were demolished. This closed in 2011, when it was merged with another school. I couldn't pin down what the other school was, but Moorside was what's known as a first school or infant school, so an educated guess is that this combined with Cleveland Middle School to form the current NCEA Grace Darling campus. Just beyond the old school is an area dedicated to the former New Biggin Colliery, which was sunk in 1908. The colliery closed in 1967, but at its peak in 1940, it employed some 1,400 men. These memorials stand on a former railway line. The railway line branched off from the line we mentioned yesterday and ran into the colliery. It was a small colliery, dwarfed by nearby Woodhorn, which occupied a much larger site on the outskirts of New Biggin. 
You can also access the former colliery site off Woodley as well. Uh, Woodley is on the other side of the demolished school over there and there's an entrance we passed on the first day that we were here which runs into the colliery this way uh, and you can access the site from there as well. My route was supposed to follow a footpath at this point which runs through this but for some reason I couldn't find where to go. No matter, because we can see this from the other side shortly anyway. This is Alexandra Park. It's a unique development of 28 single occupancy bungalows and a four bedroom house, all located within extensive grounds. They're designed for people with learning disabilities and those on the autism spectrum. I then spent a few minutes exploring the main residential properties in this part of New Biggin. There's a lot of miners' houses in this area. Much like Lynemouth, these are predominantly long rows of terraces either side of Woodhorn Road. This area is known as Woodhorn Demesne according to a map I found at the memorials. Demesne is an old term which signified land, sometimes with estate buildings attached to a manor and retained by the owner. Okay, so uh, at the end of Pelor Avenue, we take a left turn back to Woodhorn Road. Now, this is a bit of a, a strange part of this route. I've got to basically turn right uh, and then sort of turn left back on myself and form a little loop. It seems weird on the map. You'll see what it uh, looks like in the uh, Strava map at the end of the video. I would imagine that Woodhorn de Mesny was, before the mines existed, part of the former Woodhorn Parish before it merged with New Biggin. Once an expanse of fields, it was then built upon when the collieries came along. And we're back to the colliery memorial area. Now this column initially I believed to be a war memorial, and it is, but it's a special type. It's for the First World War only and it's dedicated to those who worked in the colliery. Here's its plaque, which is inscribed with the words to the glorious memory of the 575 officers and men from New Biggin Colliery who served in the Great War 1914 to 1918, of whom 92 died in the cause of liberty. It's a unique memorial and one that just goes to show how that in the war, men from all walks of life were willing to defend this country. This is where the main walk ends for day three, but we're not quite finished yet. For the past few days, while we've been up here in the northeast, we've been staying at Woodhorn Grange, which is sited on part of the former Woodhorn Colliery. I'm going to take you back to our hotel now and show you what it looks like these days. So this is the view we were treated to from our hotel room every morning whilst we were here. This is the Queen Elizabeth II Country Park, an excellent example of restored industrial land and once the biggest colliery spoil heap in Europe. The main feature of the site is a 16 hectare lake, which is surrounded by open grassland and woodland. The lake is also a popular venue for sailboarding, canoeing and coarse fishing. It was, of course, once a coal mine. For more than 80 years, this was part of Woodhorn Colliery. Work to sink the first shaft began in 1894 and the first coal was brought to the surface in 1898. At its peak, almost 2,000 men worked at the pit and 600,000 tonnes of coal were produced each year. When production stopped, the shafts continued to be used by neighbouring Ashington Colliery until 1986. The park has been here since 1979 according to this pit wheel and it was opened by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Now there's much more to the Woodhorn Colliery site than just this. In fact, part of the former colliery is now a museum and that is where we're going to start day four. I'll see you tomorrow. The Woodhorn Colliery Museum originally opened in 1989 and was declared a scheduled monument in 1999. This is the most well-preserved example of a late 19th and early 20th century colliery in the northeast of England. The museum depicts the lives of coal mine workers and uses the colliery's original buildings and equipment to do so. This building, for example, is one of them and it dates from 1912. This is used as an information point. The museum closed for a time while it underwent a major redevelopment, reopening in 2006. During that time, architect Tony Kettle, when redeveloping the new building, created the cutter, which you'll see in today's picture bit. Several of its buildings contain original equipment and mining exhibits, whilst others have been converted to museum exhibit areas. 
In addition to exhibits about the mine and the life of a miner, the museum features a permanent collection of art. There's even a small narrow gauge railway which runs to the country park. So as well as the museum, there's also Woodhorn Village, which is a, a very small little hamlet with a disused church on the outskirts of Newbiggin. That's our next stop. Woodhorn also has an old mill. Also known as the Lynemouth Windmill, it apparently once served as a navigation aid for sailing ships out at sea. It was also converted into a pillbox during World War II. It's now disused and stands empty. The mill stands at the entrance to the former Alcan factory, which we talked about in the Lynemouth episode. There's a memorial stone here which commemorates the planting of 23,000 spring bulbs by pupils from local schools in 1990. Woodhorn Village is interesting enough by itself. It was a former civil parish in its own right before being incorporated into Newbiggin by the sea. In 1931 it had a population of 219, most of whom worked in the two mines. The village contains, somewhere within it, a bell which is inscribed with the words Ave Maria and it's believed to be one of the oldest in existence. Now you may not think it, but perhaps Woodhorn's most striking feature is its cemetery. So one of the features of Woodhorn Village is this funeral director's AJ Gascoigne and Sons and uh, there's a, a cemetery attached to this, Woodhorn Cemetery, which is yeah. quite the amazing it, it looks place. Like, looks like these funeral directors own and manage the cemetery as well, which is which is really good. It's something that's usually seen in America. Let's go in and have a look. Yeah, this definitely. is quite the place, trust me. This is easily one of the most interesting cemeteries we've ever seen. Take a look around the edge and you'll see walls with holes in them. I'd never seen one before, but those are columbariums designed to hold cremated remains. The cemetery was opened in 1995 after Gascoigne's purchased the land adjacent to their premises. At that time, there was a need for a new burial ground in the area following the closure of St. Bartholomew's Churchyard in New Biggin. And finally, we come to the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. This is the oldest building in Wandsbeck, with parts dating back to the 11th century, but it's not functioned as a church since 1973. It was once the mother church in the parish of Woodhorn with New Biggin. In recent decades, the building has housed a museum and artist studios, and New Biggin Town Council set up the Woodhorn Church Working Group to discuss the future use of the now vacant building. And if you can take any more New Biggin by the Sea, here comes today's picture bit.
bigger than me. And I'm quite tall, five foot seven. And there you go, that has been the town of Newbiggin by the sea. Mm -hmm. And Nikki just wants to say a few more words about Woodhorn Cemetery before we wrap this one up. What have you got for us, Yeah, I've, I've been doing a little bit of research after our little walk around there. Um, this one was opened after St Bartholomew's uh, on the church point in Newbiggin, close to new burials. And the cemetery itself is for exclusive use of the clients of the funeral director. The column bearing is called the Rose Wall, which is rather nice, I think. Um, but one thing we I did notice as I was walking around was just how inclusive this cemetery is, and it doesn't matter who you are. If you're attached to this funeral directors, you can, you know, be laid to rest here. We've seen uh, there's a baby garden here. There are people who are obviously local because on the cemetery markers there's paintings of New Biggin Bay. Um, there's people from the travelling community. I've seen the grave of a doctor, um, I've seen a football fan, you know, there's all sorts of things in every kind of denomination, anything, any kind of person, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I think you all know what I mean. Um, a, a very much a cross section of the community uh, that, that's laid to rest in the cemetery. But yes, I, I do think it's rather nice and, uh, you know, yes, there's a lot of flowers, a lot of, you know, silk flowers, which some people might find gaudy, but I'd sooner see a lot of colour from silk flowers that last all the year round and a lot of dead flowers just left there to rot. You Pretty know, much. That's, that's, that's my feeling. Yeah, I like that. I but, like that. Yeah, it, it's a lovely place and, you know, it, it's not miserable and dreary as you would expect a cemetery to be. It's, you know, the... They, they bought this plot of land, they decided what they were going to do and they just ran with it and you know, fair play and absolute props to them for doing it. I agree. Okay, time for us to move on to our next one here in Northumberland. I've got one left before we wrap up this trip and I've definitely saved the best until last. I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot and that's been Mrs Village Idiot. This has been the town of Newbiggin by the Sea and Windy we're Newbiggin out. By the sea. And we're out. <laughs>